So yes, I guess we should begin. Uh, welcome to the 10th episode of our um, webinar series, Artificial Intelligence and Religion, co-organized by the Center for Religious Studies and the Center for Communication in, um, Information and Communication Technology of uh, Fondazione Bruno Kessler. Um, today's speaker is um, Nahum Dershowitz, Professor of Computer Science on the Chair of Computational Logic at uh, Tel Aviv uh, University. And today we also have uh, uh, as a guest Oliviero Stock from the Center for Information and Communication Technology of uh, Fondazione Bruno Kessler. Before, so thank you both for being here with us today. That's great. Before um, I will give the floor to um, before I give the floor to Oliviero um, for a short introduction, um, um, please let me, me remind you that this meeting will be or is being recorded already. Uh, so if you do not want to be recorded, just switch off your webcams, uh, your uh, cameras, and uh, mute your microphones. Um, at any rate, I would like to ask you to um, mute your microphones and uh, switch off the webcams during the presentation and switch them on only when uh, during the discussion when you want to say something later on. So without um, further ado, um, let me give the floor to Oliviero Stock for his introduction. Thank you, Oliviero. Thank you, Boris. And thank you also to Marco Ventura, director of ISR. And uh, thank you to Nahum for his coming intervention. I would like to take this opportunity for saying a couple of words about my personal view of uh, the relation between AI and religion. So let me start by this. About one year ago, on the most important Italian newspaper, Corriere della Sera, appeared uh, an article by one of the most famous writers in Italy, a, a she writer, um, in which uh, uh, she spoke uh, about, uh, about uh, religion and uh, spoke about the relation between the Jewish religion and, uh, and the Christian religion. And uh, it was incredible. She came out uh, with uh, uh, standard uh, accusation of the tradition of, uh, say, the, the traditional Christian avenue to anti-Semitism, which of course was overcome uh, at least by, by the, the Council of Vatican II. Um, but this person, this writer, she's a good writer. I believe she's also a good person. Uh, and she is, uh, um, um, she is uh, someone in general that writes uh, about, uh, she's a progressive person. So, uh, of course, what she brought up a uh, turmoil in, uh, in Italy. And uh, my, my understanding that, that she was uh, in good faith, but simply totally ignorant. And this is also something characteristic of, of Italy that people sometimes uh, speak of, uh, of things uh, of which they are uh, not competent without thinking about the consequences. And um, so I thought, uh, uh, I mean, of course, uh, it's not only touching a sensitive uh, uh, element uh, like uh, what was uh, the traditional uh, uh, anti-Semitism and disputes that went on for centuries, but uh, also, of course, it had also social consequences, and especially in a period like now where uh, anti-Semitism and other aspects uh, of uh, uh, hate are apparent throughout the world. Um, so my point is that if there were 
an environment that would help with some element of AI, avoiding to make what I really think are bad errors by mm, critiquing what uh, what uh, uh, has been written. It doesn't need to be very, 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 very sophisticated. It's enough to be uh, to to ring a bell if there is association among certain words that may have certain um, uh, certain result in the overall understanding. Okay, so one point is on a topic as important as uh, uh, religion and uh, the consequences, the social consequences that uh, uh, religions uh, may uh, bring about, it could be very, very important to have uh, AI helping in critiquing communication. Second point, um, I think that AI can have a, an important role for a religious community, for instance, in bringing together people that uh, are not together, but also people that are not together across time. For, for instance, living memories and integrating uh, memories, even oral memories, so that can be shared by a group of people in, uh, in, uh, when they convene uh, religion. A third element that I think uh, is obvious is the role of AI for bringing about uh, knowledge about religion. All uh, types of uh, digital humanities may help in this sense. Uh, let me just mention one uh, thing that uh, is uh, the uh, help in the teamwork on translation of the Talmud that was brought about by a group uh, of the National Council of, of Research in Pisa. And it's an ongoing project, uh, and of course it goes to the benefit of knowledge about religion, but there are many things that could be said. And of course among those, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, the speaker of today, Nahum Dershowitz, had a, a, a great contribution about uh, um, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, bringing about and integrating uh, the remains of the Dead Sea Scrolls for uh, appreciation by a larger public. Um, then, if you want, uh, there is a team that I, I, I'm not so, so uh, uh, keen about uh, that, uh, in any way, uh, is considered by many, uh, which is a kind of perversion of AI. So, uh, having to do with AI as a religion per se, I consider it as a a perversion. And, and then comes uh, uh, the theme that is close to today's talk, and it is uh, AI, ethical values, and religion. Um, so there are, this is a, a hot topic also in Europe. Uh, there have been uh, uh, important uh, uh, decision about uh, about uh, the funding of AI in the future that must include some aspect uh, that go in in this uh, direction, but uh, I think uh, uh, it's very interesting to uh, to spend a couple of words about uh, the methodology for the most ambitious view of uh, uh, bringing ethical um, reasoning into AI. So not only ethical values combined with, uh, with uh, AI, for instance, in the design, but also the uh, progress in 
uh, autonomous ethical decision making. I think that basically, in principle, there are three approaches. Um, one comes uh, fro from simply bringing into the system the wealth of knowledge that comes from philosophy, possibly from religion, and uh, from those uh, traditions, and somehow, uh, somehow uh, implementing models that reproduce uh, some aspects of what has been said in this tradition. Second view is uh, something that connects to a, a recent, more recent uh, view that uh, has appeared in, uh, in cognitive science, for instance, also in economical science. So to understand how people in a given society actually decide on ethical issues or uh, this, uh, decide uh, uh, their judgment of the behavior of others. So what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Okay, this is the second avenue. For instance, uh, um, uh, implemented in the, in the famous uh, uh, trolley approaches. But I think that uh, Nahum will speak a bit about that. And um, a third view, probably the most uh, ambitious of them all, but uh, maybe in principle considerable, is to have a, a phylogenetic uh, evol evolutionist approach. So to build a society of artificial agents, and to accelerate, so to say, their evolution and to see if uh, somehow with some stimulus, but mostly automatically through uh, different generation, some kind of uh, uh, ethical values appear in this society. It could be in, in, it's very, very ambitious, but in principle, it could bring about something that maybe, maybe it brings also something new in, in relation to what the human experience has been so far. Okay. Aside of this, let me just say two words uh, about, uh, about today's speaker, Nahum. Nahum. Uh, is a professor at uh, Tel Aviv uh, University. He's one of the leading figures uh, in theoretical computer science. He worked on the computability theory and computational logic, program verification. So areas that are really at the uh, uh, at the root of uh, a lot uh, of what. Uh, AI uh, means from the theoretical uh, point of view and also from an applied point of view. Um, he's the author of several books. Uh, one is very, is very pleasurable also for a larger public and is uh, concerned with the calculation of different calendars uh, in, in, in various civilizations, very pleasant. Um, specifically then, as I hinted before, um, Nahum uh, has made a major contribution to computer analysis of historical manuscripts. And uh, this uh, Scripta Qumranic Electronica project to which he greatly uh, contributed is, uh, is uh, I think, something that really uh, is a present to the world. So having said this, now it is my pleasure to give the floor to Nahu. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so, so thank you, Oliviero, for everything you said and touched upon some of the topics I do want to talk about. Thank you, Boris and Isabella, for 
arranging all this and I'm really sad that we can't be doing this face to face and the circumstances preclude normal uh, uh, no, normal conference ac seminar activities. So uh, if you see my screen, I, I want to talk about artificial intelligence and morality. So back back in Eden, there was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. So knowledge, we, we have an intelligence in which we're, we're using to decide what is moral and what is not immoral, what is good and what is evil. Now that we have artificial intelligences, the question is how to endow them with computational morality so that artificial intelligences behave in, in the most moral way possible. Now, it used to be that philosophers would, would sit in a coffee shop here, uh, sit in a coffee shop here like, like Sartre and Beauvoir and debate issues. But uh, that's no longer, so here's a kind of issue that I might debate. You're walking in a desert and there's one bottle of water and it's not enough for the two people here to survive. And the question is then, do, do, does the person with the bottle, in this case, uh, she's standing with a bottle on her head, does she keep the water for herself and she survives because it's enough to get to civilization or does she share it? So this is a famous, uh, discussion in the Babylonian Talmud, where it says two people in the desert, one jug of water, if they both, if they share it, they both die because it's not enough. And if one drinks, that one person survives. And there are two opinions here, two conflicting opinions des described in the Talmud. One, this fellow Ben Petora says, you, you can't watch someone else die. You have to share your water so that he lasts longer, as long as possible even if you both die, while well, the famous uh, scholar Rabbi Akiva said, no, you do not have to sacrifice your life to help the, to, to help the, the life of another person. And, and so uh, back in Switzerland, um, more than a century ago on this PhD thesis, he, uh, he discusses these two opinions and he sort of, I think, thinks Ben Petora's idea is a bit Christ more Christian-like and Akiva is more Jewish-like in this conflict of values. So, so in fact, we have the question of what, what are the right moral values is always debatable. But another example, there have been many instances where airplane pilots have uh, tried to avoid killing many people by crashing in a populated area. And they're considered heroes for diverting the plane to a less populated place. And, and this uh, famous example back in uh, World War II, so this was a training mission, but the plane uh, lost control and everyone was able to bail out, parachute out of the plane, but the pilot stayed in the plane and died in order to prevent the plane from hitting the town of Darlington in England. And he's considered a he hero. He sacrificed his life to increase the probability of the people on the ground surviving. And so that's another question. Do you sacrifice your life for the many? So in general, in ethics, you have these three categories, something you ought to do, what's morally obligatory, things that are morally wrong, you should not do, they're prohibited, forbidden, and neutral things that you may or may not do. So you might say that in this case, whether uh, you, you jump out of a plane and save yourself, or you stay in the plane to steer it away from anybody is in the middle category. Clearly, no one, no one would put him in jail for for jumping from the plane, even if someone on the ground was killed. Now, now that we're no longer sitting in the in the coffee shops and, and discussing these things, we we we, we need to think more seriously. I think uh, uh, not just more seriously, but more reach conclusions if we want to endow artificial intelligences like uh, robots and androids with, with the moral sensibility. Now, now, so if you have a robot in, in some time in the future who's, who's going to help us should act, I presume, like, like the perfect, perfect concierge to accommodate everyone as long as the, the actions are both moral, uh, moral and also legal and, and of course possible to do. 
So, and, the, and if this is an Android, it has to be morally possible, legally possible, and also possible for the robot to do. As uh, the uh, father, I guess, of cybernetics, let's say if we want to build a device, a mechanical agency, we need to make sure that the purpose we put in the machine is the purpose we really desire, that, that we teach the machine, we program the machine to do what we really want, and, and this is part of the problem. So we want this AI intelligence only to do good. That's the goal. So we want to Im imbue our algorithms with our moral values, and, and that's what I want to talk about. So we now, now that we almost have autonomous cars, or we sort of have them here and there, and th this is an autonomous car that was driving around Stanford AI lab when I was there in the 70s. So they were already ha had uh, such things uh, almost 50 years ago. So now, now this car passes the driving test, okay, and is, is allowed on the road. Unfortunately, you have these incidents like the Uber car that killed the bicyclist because the algorithm didn't realize in the dark that this was a person on a bike and the person sitting in the car was busy doing something else instead of paying attention and someone died so this is what we want to avoid and the question in, in the most basic case do not thou shalt not kill how do we prevent the device from killing now it's been a long uh, a long time already that we have machines with computers in them that, that make uh that can cause death or life and death decisions so there's this there was this radiation machine in 1982 that killed several patients because of a design flaw. That it was possible if you punched in the wrong keys in the wrong order to get an overdose of radiation and people died from that. So this is not a new problem, but it's becoming more and more pervasive. So if machine, but we've gone further. Now we have machines designed to kill. We have cruise missiles and so on. and. They need to distinguish between friend and foe, who only hit the, the bad people and not hit the good people. And there was some famous case with, with some cruise missile that the operator noticed some kids or something and, and prevented the lot, launch. So we usually say we want the human in the loop, a human to, dis, to make the final decision, go or no go, based on a wider view than our artificial intelligences today are capable of. This I don't think is sustainable. The decisions in the future, we won't have enough time for a human in the middle. We have to make a decision in less time than is available. And we cannot rely on a human who is not necessarily perfect either to, to make the final decisions. So to summarize up to now, I would say that until now, philosophers have been debating ethics and many of the questions are not resolved. They, they remain uh, they, they remain up, uh, different schools of thought feel differently about them, but if we're going to have algorithms make such decisions now, then we need to, to come to a conclusion and legislate the, the moral values in a way that we can design the algorithms and verify algorithms accordingly. So uh, unless we know what to do in, the, in these kind of situations, we, we, we're not going to be able to endow our algorithms with the right decisions. And I think government needs to do this. We can't leave, the, leave this to some 20-year-old uh, programmer with no experience to design the algorithms that are keeping our uh, dangerous technology running. I, I taught a seminar two years ago at Tel Aviv about, about ethics and, and uh, computer science. And all the students there said this was the first time. They all this is a third third year students. They're all working full time or part time, and they all said that this is the first time they thought about these issues. They've been designing programs and didn't even ha have the tools or, or, or the knowledge to think about how how it impacts. Uh, and ethical considerations. Okay, so famously, Isaac Asimov dealt with it in his uh, novels. 
And he proposed, you know, the famous three laws of robots. In other words, a robot can't be ordered to kill a human being. That a robot should not harm human beings. That was principle number one. But this is a plot device. The principles didn't really work. And and this, so we're back to, we need, we need to agree and legislate and design the morals by which we want at least the machines to live. So I'm thinking of a formal artificial morals, formal in the sense that it's, it's uh, expressed in a, in a formal logical language, artificial so that we're talking about an autonomous computer that's going to live by these guidelines. And the morality means to know what's right and wrong, what must be done, may not be done, or, or, it's, or can be done. So if we want, uh, everything goes back to classical times um, in Greece. So, so Aristotle can, can, can uh, write his ethics. And uh, he also famously wrote, uh, you know, sort so of the father of symbolic logic. And, and so, so we, ha we have logic. And, and ethics, both from Aristotle and even the artificial devices, go back, you know, to, to, to uh, Telos defending. So here we have a robot defending Crete. And and making life and death decisions in order in in its attempt to de, to defend and and to fo to follow the design what it was designed to do. So for the philosophers, we, we they need to help society decide what the right principles are. For logicians, we need to find the right logics to reason about moral issues. And as computer scientists, we need to be able to program them and, and guarantee that the programs comply with these uh, designs. Let me, let me start with the question of the principles. So, so one principle is the golden rule, the famous golden rule in Leviticus, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, or in the New Testament, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, or as Hillel and the Mishnah, Phrased it negatively, don't do to others what is what you don't want others to do to you. So this is the golden rule, and we can try to make that in, in, into one of the guiding principles, sort of a Kantian ethics, a categorical th that what what is moral is something that if everyone was to do the same, it would be uh, it, it would be good. So never mind the details; there are problems with that. So another example where this is already in practice is the computers making triage decisions whom you know, in, where, where there are multiple injuries or, or many, many people coming to the hospital at the same time or not to talk about the coronavirus when it started in Italy. And the, the hospitals were, had to make decisions who, whose lives to try to save first. And, and today, computers are sometimes being used to, to make such decisions. And again, we need the criteria. Now, the criteria for whom to save, there, there are many issues, there are many possibilities. Do we do a first come, first serve? The, if you're a doctor, the first person you, you see whom you help, is that the first one you help? Or do you go look for those that need your help most? Or do you first help uh, policemen and firemen and, and other doctors and nurses so that they can help more people? These guidelines are, are also, I mean, they're sometimes legislated, but they're not always followed. And as uh, Oliviero mentioned, there's a famous trolley problems, which, which are used to help uh, decide on such issues. And a book by Philippa Foote in 67, and, and the situation here in this uh, picture, you, ha you have a trolley that's out of control, it's on its way to run over five people, and you, there you are, have the opportunity to switch the rail so that that car, instead of running over the five people, turns the other uh, onto the sidetrack, but there is someone else who can't get away on the sidetrack. So you should you cause the death of the one person in order to save the five people? Should you do nothing? Uh, this this is a value judgment that again not everyone agrees about, and, and so most people say, and, and Olivia mentioned that that people uh, sort of have uh, done all kinds of surveys about this question and say 
in Western society, most people will say, <coughs> pull the switch, save, save the five at the expense of the one. But what if that one is your sister? Uh, so I don't think anyone would blame the poor guy over there for not killing his sister, even if the train is otherwise going to kill other people. Again, th these are issues that, that society needs to uh, decide on, and we can't put off the decision too long because these very these issues are being built into algorithms. Here's, here's the best solution. Uh oh, Nicholas, this train is going to crash into these five people. Should we move the train to go this way, or should we let it go that way? Which way should the train go? Yeah, that, that, that's this kid's solution. So a few years uh, before Foote's book, uh, a famous Israeli rabbi raised a very uh, essentially equivalent uh, question. So here you had a, the question is, someone shoots an arrow, okay? There's an arrow that's shooting, it's going to hit a powder keg and you know kill all these dancing people, but and you have the option of deflecting the arrow but it's going to, then it will kill one person. And again, the issue here is that you're doing something that's causing death for a greater good. And is that morally right or wrong? So, and this question actually goes back 100 years in the University of Wisconsin. There was like this questionnaire, the same kind of thing that there's, a, I mean, the move, swiftly moving train, it's pretty much the same thing. There's a child on a track and, and what do you do? do you, whom do you save? The, the, this issue, the, these kind of questions have been around for a long time, but these questions are already in the Bible in several stories, which, uh, so <clears throat> famous Jonah, Jonah says, you know, there's a storm, the boat is going to sink, I know it's because of me, throw me overboard, and, and all the other sailors say, no, 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 and they try hard to, to uh, save the ship, and not successful, so they throw him in the water, and everything's fine, so here he's you know, giving up his life, in order to save the boat. And, and the people on the boat, though, try their best not to. And it's only because he said, throw me in, that they did. An, <clears throat> another famous uh, discussion along these lines, someone came to, to this, um, uh, uh, I think, a fourth century rabbi, Rava, and said that he, he's been told, you know, either kill somebody or be killed. You have this often, kill or be killed. And his answer was, what, how can you say that your blood is redder than the other person in the sense that, that your life is worth more than the other person's life? No, therefore don't kill. But what if it's many people versus one? Is it different? There's another sad story in World War II. This, this rabbi was in a concentration camp. He survived. And he was in 1944 in Auschwitz, and someone comes to him and says that, that 1,400 boys are being uh, are scheduled to be killed. And my son, I, I can redeem my son, I, whatever, I can bribe the guard to save my son. However, if, if I save my son, they still have a quota of 1,400. So with the capo who got the bribe, will take another child instead. And he comes you know, on the holy day of the year to the rabbi and says, what should I do? Should I save my, may, may I save my son? Okay, so here, here, the point, he's not doing anything. I mean, maybe he's bribing, but he, he's not killing anybody, but he's going to cause the death of one person instead of the other. And the rabbi just had, didn't know what to say. He said, I can't answer such a question. And when he said, I can't answer this question, the person said, well, then I take your answer to be no, and, and I'm not going to do anything. And his son died, and he felt that this is you know, comparable to the binding of Isaac. He's sacrificing his son, it, it, for moral value. Back to the trolley problem, another version of the trolley problem, it, it's kind of a peculiar scenario, but that you're standing on a bridge, <coughs> the trolley, you see the trolley there it, it is going to head into all these people, and if you throw someone overboard or you push a truck overboard with the person inside it, it's going to stop the runaway trolley and save the five people, but the single, the single guy on top is going to die. Now, this is treated somewhat differently from the previous case where you pull a switch because here you're actually pushing someone to his death 
in order to save others. So, so this is a more extreme case. Again, uh, so, so at least in the West, many people are reluctant in this scenario. They're willing to pull the, the switch, but they're not willing to push someone over the bridge. On the other hand, Buddhist monks say, what's the difference? I mean, he's going to die, he's going to die. The, the issue of agency is, is less uh, relevant to them. So again, so this is, there, there are many cultural distinctions, that, that, and there's no one answer, I think. So you have uh, so MIT is, is asking people these kind of questions in an online survey. So here the, here the question is, do you prefer babies or ladies? Or what if, okay, if the car is going to kill, kill either two, ch two babies or two adults, which is better? Again, that's a cultural, some, some cultures prefer, the, uh, would say, the, the old people have, have uh, more invested in them, they're, they're more sagacious, they have more to give society, it's easier to have. And others will say the opposite, save the children, or save the women, or save the men, or save, the, these are, you know, uh, whom you decide to save, given a choice, is something that now needs to be programmed into the car when the car needs to decide. And, and this actually came up. Okay, so, so my wife raised this question. What, uh, yeah, uh, the women may be pregnant. That's another issue. Do, do you, is it, how do you treat a pregnant woman more than, an, more than a non-pregnant woman or not? So uh here suppose the, the, my drawing is not so great but you, you have a choice between two carriages that you can't see if there's a child in them or a doll and, and one carriage there where where you know it's a it's a baby so so do you take probability into account what what's the likelihood that that those carriages have a baby and, and not a doll and, and factor that in or not another question okay they've done experiments with killing mice but i don't think that tells you what people do with uh, when it's a question of killing people. Another, another famous story along these lines, the, the sorry, uh, where uh, the German car maker said that they're going to save the occupants before they save the people on the street. I'll get back to that. I think, I think there's also a difference between individual behavior and society behavior. That, that society may have to maximize life, even though the individual not. And then again, there's a question, what do you do? What do you program into the car? What, what you would tell a driver to do or what society, uh, what's best for society? Uh, another biblical example where, where, where General uh, uh, Yoav came to a town and wanted to kill everybody because there was uh, a, a, this fellow Sheba who uh, was uh, convicted and uh, for and uh, so the wise woman said okay don't, don't destroy us all i'll give uh, this, the people the townspeople will take care of it is, is that right or wrong because it sort of conflicts with what we said before about who who's dumb who, whose blood is redder okay so th this is the quote i meant before uh, where mercedes benton that if all you know for sure is that one death can be prevented your first priority is to save the occupant, but later on, the, the government in Germany uh, sort of made, made that kind of, I don't know if they made it illegal, but the regulations are that you cannot prefer, they issued guidelines in which you do not prefer the life of the occupant. But again, that, that's pretty peculiar because uh, the driver of a car usually will care more about uh, the family, his family in the car than about a random person on the street, given the, given the choice. But again, while we would not come, I think, to the driver and complain one way or the other, whatever the driver decided in the split second, whether to swerve or not, when we're programming this, we need to know which decision to make. But but then, what, what if the driver of the car, you know, just was at the doctor and the doctor said, you have one month to live. And so now maybe he's more willing to give up his life to save other people. Do, do we have a dial in the car? You set your self-preservation instinct. And what if you're uh, depressed that day? You turn the dial the other way. This is a uh, another issue that, that that the variation here in the range of not you know the middle range of morals is still a, a problem to formalize. Okay, that that was. Just saying that, that society and, and the philosophers and the ethicists 
Ni and each society for itself needs to decide. But but then logicians need to make these uh, decisions formal. I mean, the, <coughs> formalize the, the ethics because and not just uh, speak about them so that we'll be able to reason about them. And logicians need to come up with the formal logics. And they haven't done much of that. Okay, we're back. So, so I, there are one or two books. This actually, a minister wrote a book using second order logic to formalize, you know, Kantian ethics. So there are some attempts along these lines. Uh, you need to take into account many things. There are different actions and there are different agents around. So one of the rules here says, uh, you know, in some context C, you can do the action A. Uh, but if it's a violation of ethical principle, that, then, you know, you, you shouldn't be doing it, only if it doesn't violate an ethical principle. So how do we formalize in the formal language the, the ethical considerations that we want the devices uh, to follow? And so we have the, the different the schools of thought. You have a you have utilitarian ethics, very popular, where the goal is to maximize utility. I don't know exactly what that means, but maximize life, minimize death, or maximize pleasure, so to speak. So the utility in this uh, formulation is the integral of the, the pleasure times the length of the pleasure times the probability that, that you're going to have that much pleasure or non-pleasure. And this is the utility function that you try to maximize. One problem I see, I mean, I see many problems with it, but, but in the famous work by Nobel Prize winning Kahneman and his colleague Tversky, they found that that, uh, that when you look back on the past, your notion of what was pleasurable is not the same as when you're in it at the moment. Famously, don't take a two-week vacation if you can take a one-week vacation, because all you're going to remember next year is the last day of the vacation and the peak, you know, the best or the worst day. And all the rest, you know, will, will be the same. So, so then the in integrating over time is not exactly the right thing to do. Another issue, I think, is that you cannot, like in some formulations, it is not the action th that you need to judge, but the plan. So in this, in this scenario I made up here, you have the thing as before, but there is a third siding to the, to the railroad. Now, you, the, the railroad here is heading for one person. And if you pull one switch, it's going to head for five, which of, no one would say is the right thing to do. But you're intending to run over to the second switch and pull it, and then the, the trolley is going to go off on a siding and not kill anybody. So even though momentarily between the two switches, it's heading for five people, and you're the cause of, of, of that eventuality because your plan, which hopefully will work out, is to run over to the other switch, and you think you're going to make it and save everybody. So the, the morality of, of the action of pulling the switch doesn't depends on, on what the plan of action you have and the likelihood that you'll succeed in carrying it out. Okay, the other issues of causality. So, so for some people, who causes it or what causes it makes a difference, and not just what happens. Let me, but, but, and this gets complicated. And also, people, people have been trying to formulate this recently in, in legal or computer science circles and so on. But it's, again, it's not easy to, to, to find the right logic to express it. So, so faulty brakes cause an accident. In other words, were not for the faulty brakes, there wouldn't be an accident. But that doesn't mean that the brakes are, are the cause, and they may, they're, they're contributing cause, but maybe they're not the sole cause. And if they're not the sole cause, you know, so what is the the, the real cause? Or um, or what if the accident would have happened anyway? The person would have died anyway. So so you're killing someone who is going to die. You know, there's an arrow on the way, and and, and you hit him with a car. So he was going to die a second later. All, all these issues need to be formalized in order to be dealt with properly. Finally, what, what are uh, computer scientists uh, going to do? Famously, uh, Don Knuth said that you don't really understand something until you've taught it to a computer, until you've programmed it. It's not just 
not just that you can explain it to your students, say, right? not just that you understand it yourself, but you need to program it and others make it, in that sense, formal uh, as an object. And, and, and okay, so, so there are all kinds of, uh, going, uh, okay, so yes, I deal in verification sometimes, and there are all kinds of different formal methods and different frameworks in which you can try to express the behavior of, of the algorithm and express the, the, the desired requirements and, and try to, to, to make sure that the program meets the requirements. So, so the, some of the metro lines in Paris are automated. There is no driver. Nahum, uh, Nahum I, uh, I apologize for interrupting. Just um, make sure to um, come to an end soon because we would like to have some time for discussion. Sure. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. Thank you. Fine. Yes, it's 25 minutes already. OK, so, so I, I think not only do, do the ethics have to be transparent, we need to formalize the ethics in a way that we can reason about it, but also AI has to be transparent. The algorithms must be transparent. We need to be able to reason about the algorithms. Now, frame. There are two kinds of algorithms around these days in AI. There's the planning, the reasoning, the, the old way in which a chess playing program worked by choosing, uh, looking at different paths and choosing the best paths and reasoning. Uh, and then there's today neural networks where you look at a pattern and without, without having any uh, specific um, plan of action to, to, judge, to judge the situation. And often these networks are, are oblivious to some uh, odd circumstances. They have this inductive bias that they haven't seen. Or famously, you know, you have this picture, you put a little bit of random noise in it, and, and now the algorithm that's driving the car thinks it sees this uh, clown in front of it. And so, so I think that we cannot allow black box systems on the road or any place in the public sphere. If you're going to design an algorithm, it needs to be an algorithm that we can test. We can at least test its behavior. And even if it's a neural network, the neural network has to be open for, for, for endless testing, whether it complies. But I really think you need a white box system. You need to be able to reason about the behavior of the system. And so, so when Elon Musk says it's morally wrong not to deploy driver assistance because it saves lives, it's true, it saves lives, even though doesn't save all lives, but that's not enough. Okay, if you have, what I'm trying to say here is, is that if there's if there's poison in, in, in the program, you know, if it, it's if it says every millionth pedestrian killed, even if there are fewer pedestrians killed that way, that's not legitimate, and no one would would go along with that. And so we have these networks. Maybe we need a two-level system, and people are beginning to think of such things. Or you want to, the networks. The network makes observations, passes them on, but to the superego that makes the decisions. And the decisions based on the information gathering ha have to satisfy ethics. So to conclude, I think ethics need to be formalized. And because algorithms can, can ha have a critical impact, we need them to be regulated by society. They need to be transparent so that we can analyze and not and not uh, be uh, hidden by, by the company, and, and we should be able to analyze them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nahum. Um, that was a very rich, uh, rich talk. I'm sure there will be there will be questions. We will now have about 15 minutes for um, discussion. Um, so. Please just let me know if you have a question. Just write it into into the chat, and um, uh, I will keep the list. Um, so if there is maybe there already is one. Hold on. um, so maybe maybe I can start with one question. Um, um, when you when you say, I mean, I, I, I agree that in order to to uh, bring moral reasoning or moral, morally legitimate uh, um, rules of action into AI systems, you have to formalize uh, ethics because the, 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 otherwise you just won't be able to do it, uh, to bring these. Um, the question is, 
when you, when you say the decision or the, the distinction between right and wrong, good and bad, and so on, and you talked a little bit about um, about um, um, uh, the trolley problems. Um, and there was this one example you gave uh, of the rabbi who said, "Look, I am I cannot answer your question." Yeah. Um, so my question is, um, isn't it the case that there is very good evidence, given these moral dilemmas or trilemmas uh, or whatever, um, that there is simply is no uh, clear-cut distinction between good and bad in the world to be to be reflected by moral reasoning. So um, if that's the case, then um, the reaction that the rabbi gives or the answer that the rabbi gives, I cannot answer your question, that seems to me quite convincing. Um, so the point would be regarding trolley problems, for instance, that you have to uh, contextualize all this into a broader context, for, for instance, what I always think when I think about trolley problems is, well, um, the, there should be a moral responsibility um, for societies to make sure that such situations uh, do not arise in the first place or do arise in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in a very small number. So you have to reduce the cases like these. So that would be a reasonable strategy. But, but maybe I'm, um, I misunderstood something. Um, so what, what, what's your thought on this? What are your thoughts on your, this? I think there's no question that, that, that uh, everything needs to be designed as best as possible. I think that, we, that society has been much too lax with software and hardware uh, manufacturers to let them get away literally with murder and, and not holding them to task. I think that's, you know, I'm just talking about, you know, theft, Many of the examples uh, of where in, you know where information is stolen, it's more like the the bank having left the doors open at night. It's not like someone broke in. It's it, it's you know I don't know you have an SQL injection. It, it, it's it's that the software companies and the software providers have not lived up to their responsibilities, and just like society cracked down on automobile manufacturers. And, and hold them, you know, require recalls and, and for, for we, we need to make much stronger demands of the software companies require much more rigorous testing, much more rigorous uh, applications of formal methods wherever possible and not let, let them put things out on, this, on the market uh, when they're not ready. So all the more so when, and, and society is being more careful with autonomous cars. But not enough, because when there's a crash, they, they, the investigators sometimes are locked into a clean room where they can look at the code, but they can't take notes and can't take it out. That's unacceptable, I think. If you want your car to see, you have to let, you have, you have to let people look under the hood. And, and so um, what well, you're saying that some of these questions don't have cut and dry answers, I agree, but I think that we, that we no longer have that luxury because I don't want the automobile company's uh, you know, summer intern to make that decision for us, wh whether to, to, uh, you know, you know, to, to say, to, to prefer a pregnant woman over a, an old crippled man. I, I, don't, I don't think that we can uh, relinquish that, that responsibility. So even if we don't want to make these demands on individual humans when, they, when they're faced with these critical uh, decisions, death decisions, we can make these demands and we can as a society decide what demands we want to make on the software that's running and what the criteria should be. It doesn't mean it's going to be perfect, but it means that, that yes, we, we do say whether we, take a utilitarian point of view, we want to maximize something, or whether we take a, a more um, diatonic point of view, you know, thou shalt not kill, it doesn't matter how many people you're saving. Or maybe it does matter how many people you're saving, but five is not enough to justify doing something active to kill. Or uh, do you save the occupants of the car? I don't know. I, I don't think we cannot 
decide. Mm -hmm. And I don't, maybe the rules will change when you drive from Italy into Germany. That, that would be, you know, your, your car will automatically switch its moral compass. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the border. Uh, someone was asking uh, which logics. No, I think this is a problem because the logics, you know, we seem to need both reasoning about scenarios and time. And so we need temporal logics and we need second order logics, especially if you have overriding principles like uh, Kantian uh, universality principles, which, uh, and so it's not, it's not clear. And if you take, again, if you take a utilitarian approach and, and you need a utility function, and again, that, that it's not so simple which you, what, what you take into account and what not. Okay. So I don't think we have the answers to that, but I, I, I think we need to work on it. Hmm. So, thank you very much, Nahum. So this uh, uh, partly responds also to uh, Rakesh Verma's um, uh, question. Um, just to one small question, you mentioned someone who wrote a book on second order logics for formalizing Kantian ethics. Who, who was that? Again, I didn't. So I, don't, I, didn't I didn't give the name. Um, so I, I can't pull it up right now. Well, and it, does, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, I will. I, I do know that he was a religious, it was like a, a minister or something. Hmm. Okay, no, no, no problem. I'll, I'll, I'll find it out. So okay. we now have a, the book. The book is something yeah, formal ethics, a formal. Uh, Mm -hmm. Okay. We have another question from uh, Blazenka Shoya. Um, the floor is yours. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for the lecture, Professor Dershowitz. Uh, uh, I come from Lund University in the south of Sweden, and for some reason my camera is not working. So, uh, but, but uh, um, uh, you clearly made this... Um, it's complicated. It's for sure complicated. And my basic question is how 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 optimistic are you uh, with us actually achieving this, considering that the, the the technical development goes so fast. And also in in relation to the question of religion, you started with the narrative of Eden, and even there in the perfect creator, the perfect creator, if you want, decided not to create a perfect creation, but to leave room for the evil, not good or unethical, if you want. So, I mean, there is this what Boris said just recently that it, it, it is, it's a different, difficult thing. Can we ever achieve, you know, can we, can we ever have ethical AI or ethically uh, directed robots? Are, are you positive, are you optimistic? I know that we have to do something. It's not my way of ex excusing our passivity. It's just that, um, how much can we do? Uh, great question. I, 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 I cannot, no, I'm, I'm pessimistic in general, <laughs> but the, the problem here is, is that we're not investing the efforts. Uh, even in simple, you know, like, like industry, hardware industry didn't put a lot of money in, into verification, hardware verification, until uh, there was this famous Pentium bug that, that, that the chip didn't know how to divide properly. And, and then they realized they need to put money into it. And, and then the methods got much better. And now no chip is built without a, with a high degree of uh, applications of formal methods. So I, I think that uh, again, as society, we cannot, we should not let uh, let the, the technology companies run full speed ahead without uh, doing, uh, you know, applying best practices. You can't do better, maybe. And yes, we want to save lives whenever possible. We put a vaccine on the market, even you know, you know, rush things because people are dying. But, but that doesn't mean that we can let the profit motive uh, be as decisive as we do today. So uh, I'd like to see society and and uh, and legislature much more involved in regulation. And yes, keeping up is hard, but then then you put the you put the resources into keeping up. Uh, and um, and 
not let yeah. the horse get Thank away. Thank, Thank you very much, Nahum. Um, now, uh, Travis Wade uh, asked, um, how should the profit motive figure into this discussion of AI tech? Um, maybe that's, that's um, I mean, you mentioned some, uh, some issues concerning regulation, concerning state, um, uh, state regulation and so on and so forth. But maybe you could say something more about this because that's a big topic, I think. Um, I mean, they, they, because apparently the, the, there might be there might be a, a conflict here between uh, the, the 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 motive of, of accumulating profits and acting ethically. I mean, very very roughly, uh, people many people would say, okay, these two things stand. Uh, there is a conflict between these two things. So, what do you think about this? This is. Um... I mean, no, normally, what I think, I mean, it's just my personal opinions here, and, and that, but uh, but the profit motive uh, is not a significant motive and shouldn't be, uh, and isn't usually for society. The society is, is letting the software companies uh, run amok because of all the perceived benefits. Okay, we have. Uh, internet and and we have we have we have men we where society feels that it's benefiting from social media when uh, the profit when some of the implications are being hidden from society i mean we don't even we have a hard uh, way knowing even how, how much you know credit card theft there is because the companies won't tell people or or, or so I, th I think that we can demand by demanding more transparency. It's it's not that we're against the profits; it's that we're against profit and at the expense of of uh, moral behavior. Uh, we don't. We don't. Uh, there's no reason for software to be treated more leniently than than a hammer in the hardware shop mm. so so that that uh, as as soon as we will make uh, the companies responsible for their actions especially for their uh, cavalier attitude towards uh, doing things correctly morally uh, preserving uh Privacy and so on. If we make if we make them much more responsible than they are for violations of privacy, or violations uh, of uh, of uh, human uh, of, of things that are important to us, then they'll they they'll have the tools and they'll apply them and they'll hire people to do it. If, if we if we say that uh, you know the company is not responsible for what's you know, I don't know what's on, what, what's on their social media, then everything goes up there. If we tell them they are responsible, then uh, they uh, try much harder. Hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'd like to hear what other people think, not just. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we would have time for another question. Um, let me see. There's a link here, but let's not go into this now. Um, I mean, maybe Oliviero, can you, if you have uh, another question, maybe we can finish with that. Or um, I would have another one. So let me just uh, let me just um, uh, ask my question very quickly. Uh, you were skeptical skeptical about this idea of keeping the human in the loop when it comes yeah. to decision making, and I um, I understand um, when it comes to accountability. On the other hand, and responsibility, you would strictly keep humans in the loop. If I get you correctly, um, right. because if you if you think uh, of the fact that there are some highly speculative um, discussions, but not 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 just in bars or somewhere but for instance in the european commission there was this idea of or this someone someone um envisaged this idea and there was actually a note 
being discussed concerning the question of whether or not advanced AI systems should be endowed with something called like a moral personality. Yeah, I mean, there, there are these things. What, what do you think about that? I mean, I think I know your answer. My, uh, I, my guess is that you would say, okay, no, uh, that's uh, responsibility is always human responsibility, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> well, I think uh, human, yes, of society mm. as a whole. Uh, not, um, it, it's not, uh, it, it, I think that it's a responsibility of uh, the designer to design things as best as possible, to maintain them as best as possible, to, to uh, comply as best as possible. I, I don't, and not not to uh, you know, let go of the uh, you know uh, of the leash and, and let the tiger run free because it's been trained. Mm. I don't. Know. I, kn I know that that. Uh, that software developers do not put in uh, enough effort in, into such questions or mm -hmm. and they're not encouraged to because it delays uh, it delays whatever you call it when the software comes out the, the software the attitude is let's get it to market first and then worry Thank you. Thank you very much, Nahum, for this very, very rich talk. Uh, I mean, we could go on for, for hours <laughs> in our discussion. I'd love, to hear, I'd love to hear opinions of others, and feel free to write to me or... Boris, as you said, that uh, I could pose a question. Yes, of course. I have a, a very quick question. Um, what is your uh, opinion about... Uh, uh, behavior acceptance by humans about uh, um, a computer as uh, compared to human behavior. So would people judge in the same way a computer behavior as they would judge a human behavior? From an <laughs> Would they? Uh, pe people are, are very funny in how they judge. I mean, if the if the computer is a square box, they'll judge it differently than if it has a cuddly face. I mean, the way people interact with machines depends on their expectations. I don't. Um, so I'm not quite sure what you're asking. I don't. I don't. Uh, you know, I don't subscribe to any of these ideas that no, no matter how, to, how no matter how advanced. And artificial machine is it, it doesn't become uh, it doesn't have any rights it doesn't have any responsibilities it is just a machine and it's a machine who, whose uh, whose owners and designers are responsible for its behavior and uh, it's only an extension of the people and and ha has no I, w I don't see how you can put a moral judgment on what the machine does mm -hmm. and any more than you know whether, whether a knife is used to, to save a life or to, to destroy a life is up to the person wielding it <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nahum, for, for your talk and for um, the discussion. Thank you, Oliviero, for your introduction and your questions. Um, let me just uh, remind you uh, of our website for this webinar series. I just put the link into the chat again, uh, air2020.fbk.eu. Um, we will have uh, our next uh, episode on Wednesday, 24th February. And there we will have uh, Dominic Balashka, and he will talk about, uh, his talk is entitled, uh, Was Bloomer Right? Religious Values and Quantified Self in the Petabyte Age. So um, it would be great to um, see you all again uh, in two weeks' time. Until then, thank you very much again, Nahum. Thank you very much, Oliviero. And thank you very much to everyone who followed and participated in the discussion. So I'll... 
seeing you. We will see you soon again online, hopefully. Thank you all, and I look forward to future meetings. Stay healthy. Right. And you. Uh,